Ewo, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. People who don't know will not know that you and I have a relationship that predates the documentary. Very much so. And I've said that if there's anybody that is imminently qualified to do this documentary, the Afrobeats backstory documentary, it is you. My own question is, why did it take this long? Well, it has to take this long because it's a documentary over time. Normally, you can do a documentary about something that happened last week or an event, just like maybe, you know, a social event. You can do a documentary. You can do a documentary about a wedding that happened last, last week. But this one had to take this long because it's, it's the development, it's the foundation, it's the history, it's the building, it's the refining, and you know, it, it, it has to go through all those processes to come to this point. So it, it's not something that can be done in a couple of years or two years. In fact, I believe, I believe that I was there at the beginning, not necessarily right at where the spark happened, but I believe that I was there at the beginning. And that's how I based the whole chro chronological order of the documentary from when I came into music in 1999. And then when I started doing the documentary itself, and I started asking people questions. The first mention, Renegade. 98, 99. We started to see a change in the music. 1999 was the year. Oh, yeah. So I now found out that that 1999 was the same year that things started to blossom for a lot of other people as well. Of course, in the beginning, when I say the beginning, not 1999, in the beginning of when things start to change, it was in 1999. It was the, the, the prelude to 1999 was people like Junior and Pretty. In fact, it was, it was I, 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 could, I could say people like them, Dizzy K, Falola, right. you understand? Yeah. Or even Shino Peters. Because if you trace back and think about who are the first rappers, in Nigeria. So she also says, SSP says this a lot. Oh, no, no, That's no. The first one. It's a fact. It's a what fact. What is it though? Because it was rapping in... Uh, Shinomania. Was it Shinomania? It's not experience. Shinomania. Oh, well, yes. It's experience. It's experience. It's experience. Okay, okay. It's experience. Mm -hmm. But we'll go on song. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yes, to your point, right? I, I, I understand that a lot of things had built up up until 99. Yes. But 99 was when I believe the, the uh, from all the directions, 99 was, was the crossroads right. that things just blew off because that was when people like tribesmen, remedies, and plantation boys kind of like blew up, you understand, and became, so those three, uh, three, band, uh, three boy bands right. sparked off what we have today. Because they had, they had, they had singing, which is pop. They had rap. They had uh, Yoruba. They had indigenous. Uh, boo, is that what it's called? Indigenous or indi indi in indigenous? Indigenous. Right. Okay. Okay. They had native language. They had rap. They had melody. They had. Uh, they had pop. They had. Uh, Dance all kind of like you know, blackface was a you know, it was getting right. to so basically, they had everything within those three boy bands, you understand. So, and they had Idris Abdul Karim, which is you know, which was kind of like very new then. And you know, Rugged Man was saying he was speaking nonsense, but that nonsense that he was speaking was exciting to us right. for me. I actually enjoyed it, it's part of the sing along of the song when you listen to Mio Shakomo or listen to Shade. I guess a lot spoken that is just Yeah, exactly. Like, we we look forward to that part so we can do that. Make it, make it, make it, make it, make it. Yeah, so But for you, I mean, for you it had to be something of a I'm looking for the right way to frame it now. Now, you grew up in parts here. I grew up in Nigeria. You grew up in Nigeria. Right? Yeah, I grew up in Lagos. You grew up how, from when you got back till you went back to school, like how how long was that? Thirteen years. Thirteen years. So that mm -hmm. was pretty much your formative. Because I was going to say that you must have been exposed to a better way or a more sophisticated way of doing music at the time than what we were doing. Yeah, but that's the thing. At that age, I wasn't really into music 
like that. Music for me then was inspiration. Fella, you understand? Everything I do, everything I have created, all my productions, pretty much even how I even live my life in terms of consciousness is influenced and inspired by Fela and Nikola Fokuti. Like I totally leave that Fela, you know, mentality yeah. and ideology. So, and it was from his music, a little bit of his lifestyle as well, but it, it was from his I'm music. I'm not going to ask what part of the lifestyle, but it's fine. <laughs> but you see, the music is what got me here. And I'm even surprised that I did not even go into music earlier, even like as, a, as, a, as an artist. You understand so so it was it was that inroad into music that made me started you know that that kicked off the kicked off the the how should i put it the um ah, what's the word i won't say interest it's more than an interest the religion so it's like music is religion for me so now you got into music courtesy or by the way of managing a fuji act K1 the ultimate. Yes. How did that happen? Because you know, K1 at the time, K1 was already king, even though there were a couple of people older than him, but was the biggest star of but the But the king genre. is not by age though. Exactly. Exactly. So how did that connection happen for for you? That what was that conversation? What was the process that led to you managing K1 and working with him for five years? I don't know if I've told you this story before. I I was doing a documentary. Uh, a couple of years after I left law school, I was doing the documentary. I had a film degree already. So I was doing a documentary on Femme Kuti. And it was from that documentary, and a, a friend of mine, Jimmy, Jimmy the bald headed guy, we did the documentary together. He was taking pictures for Ovation Magazine, and I was filming. And he knew K1 The Ultimate, Kwam One. Was you are in the, yeah. It was, in fact, it was around that time that he changed his name to Kwam One. So he knew him and he was taking pictures for him for ovation as well and everything. So I think they were talking about something one day and he said, look, I have a friend that is doing a documentary with Femi right now. After I finish that one, would you like him to do a documentary? So just, just send something to, to Nigeria, you know, London and everything. And then he invited me. I remember the first day that I met him. Well, I've met him before, but not formally. I went to his uh, wife's office, uh, Alpha and we sat down and then he now recognized me from my film king of my country so that was like the sort of like ah you want to share a film yeah that kind of thing so and it was very very we became friends very very quickly and uh you know been to his house and everything so anyway we did the documentary and then it, it, there, there was a couple of issues that he wanted to sort out you know legally uh like contracts and stuff like that help him look at his contract so i did that for him and then of course like i said we became friends so he now said ah why don't you become my lawyer or my manager and everything and it took i think he asked me he asked me in july or august and i didn't accept until like november because i thought myself like music management i've never done music management before and especially fuji music and you know i asked my mom i asked my wife I, you know it's one of those things that you are like okay oh. yeah. and you know how they say it in yoruba but you know that's what they want to tell you but you know we talked about it and i told him i gave him my terms we agreed on terms and i said while we're doing this thing i'm going to be filming you know like i'm going to be filming everything and he said yeah like you know no problem and that's how we started so really this documentary about afrobeat started with Fuji music. It was after I finished with Wasu. In fact, it was during that I, during when I was managing Wasu that uh, I met them tribesmen, right. and then I kind of like started informally managing them when I'm in Lagos until I became their manager after Wasu and everything. Yeah, so that was how everything kind of like jumped. Right. So now you've done Wasu, and again on the other hand, I have a theory that Fuji underlines modern Nigerian music. You can't, it's hard to take away the Fuji influences and elements of our modern music. Well, when you say our modern music, are you talking about all music or music from the Southwest? Um, because in the North, right. Fuji has its origins in Were, Ajiwere, which is like Islamic yes. uh, chanting and yes. wailing yes. when they are doing fasting. Right. So 
then you can say all the stuff that they do in the north as well can be Fantastic. yeah but you see they don't they don't do fuji in the north they do islamic music like if you listen to if you watch this uh hausa films when they have like their musical breaks it's always very yeah so it's like islamic music but islamic music in the southwest is ajiwiri and then it now sort of led into praise singing and then all oh, what not asha 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 not to worry mm -hmm. now you've been pretty much recording for film since 99 i've started working with k1 i've been recording before 99 but i started this particular recording with was you in 99, in 99. yes mm. so this is some 20 plus years later well 20 years it was going to be i didn't know i was going to be involved in music for 20 years when i started mm. i just thought okay my initial contract with Wasu was for two and then I renewed and then, you know, but I didn't know that I was going to be involved in music or I just thought it was something fun. I could travel around the world, you know, hang out with Wasu and day, you know, have fun, make money and go back home. I didn't know this was going to hold and me I, for 20 I, years. You didn't know it was going to be your entire life. It, it, I didn't know it was going to be a career for me. It was something that I, I wanted to just do for fun, simply because I wanted to be recorded. You understand? I thought, okay, well, after the two years, because my initial contract was for two years, after the two years, I'll have some footage that I can put something out. And then just let on and on. Like and that. then probably go back to my law practice or keep on making film. Right. Yeah, but I didn't know it was going to hook me for 20 years. And it's funny because if you count, if you list Nigerian artists, at least since that 99, there's hardly one who does not, in a way, trace back to you. Somebody, right. so somebody, we could do we could do a family tree. Yeah, and, exactly. Ayoshunaya. I used to on say. Hand, right? I used to say, uh, up until when did Doctor Sid get married? Was it two thousand and three or two thousand and four? I, I don't remember. Doctor Sid. Yeah, Doctor Sid. His, his wedding was two thousand and three or two thousand and thirteen or so. Oh, thirteen, not three. Yes, two thousand and thirteen. So, uh, I used to say before that time that I I am connected to everybody in the music industry except Timaya. And I, that day I met Timaya at Dr. Sid's wedding. It was Tunde Ednot that introduced me to Timaya and we hung out. And I, and, and I think I posted something on Instagram. I said, now I know everybody in the industry. But you know, a funny story, a backstory about Timaya as well. <laughs> backstory about Timaya. When I came to Lagos to, uh, uh, to sign contracts with Idris Abdul Karim to take him to London for our 2004 show, uh, I told them that, look, I only have four spaces. So it's you, your manager, and two other people, whether it's dancer, backup singer, like I can't afford to take more than four people. So he said, okay, fine. So I was dealing with the manager, God bless his soul, Dako Arogundade, that's his name. So the day that I came back to collect the list and passport numbers, they gave me eight names. So they gave me eight names. <laughs> and I'm like, guy, I said four. Why are you giving me eight names? So I just took a pen. Or when I saw, in fact, the manager put his name first before Idris. You understand? So I just saw Idris and the manager's name, and I just drew a line under the fourth name. Like, so it was 1010. And so I, I, I drew a line under number four. Like, these are the four that I'm going to take. But guess who the number five was? It was Timaya. So if I had taken five, I'd have met Timaya. And wow. funny enough, maybe his life will have taken a completely different turn. But, you know, right. that is, that, that's, that's life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, the, uh, uh, the larger picture is now, there's this Ayoshonaya guy who has worked with pretty much everybody yes. and continues to make that work in that space. Yes. Were you at any point concerned that we were not documenting our history? I wasn't concerned, I was documenting it. Okay, so apart from you, like... <laughs> I, well, I, 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 I would have thought somebody would be doing something similar. You understand? Maybe from another angle or maybe from another... Like, okay, I knew Tony Tetula and to some point Idris Abdul Karim and I knew them tribesmen. So that's two out of the three boy bands. I didn't meet... Funny enough, I met Two-Face for the first time on the day that we were traveling to London with Idris Abdul Karim. I met him on that and I said to him, if Yomoroge introduced Two-Face to me, 
And I said, okay, of course I know who you are. Plantation boys, I've seen you, you know, open for uh, Naughty by Nature and all these people, you know, I, I know who you are. He now said he has just gone solo and he has just signed for Kenny's music. And I'm like, okay, cool. Next year, 2005, I am going to take you to London. And we, we almost did. I mean, that's another backstory. We almost, <laughs> we, because what we used to do was take one group and one solo artist. So 2003 was Tony Tetwila as a solo artist and they took Tribesmen. In 2004, we took Maintain as a group and Idris Abdul Karim. And 2005, it was going to be Two-Face and uh, uh, Olufumi Style Plus, yes, and we, 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 we almost did. So that was when I met Two Face. I met him on the day that we were going to London with uh, Id Idris Abdul Karim. Right. So, Afro is the backstory. Yes. What was the timeline? When did you start recording up until now that you were premiering it? Recording the interviews. Okay, so you've had the interviews. Right? Yeah, I've had the interviews. Did you see you, the funny did thing you about set it? out making it. Sorry, and you go back, hold that thought. Did you set out to make this is what it's going to be, or you had several interviews that occurred to you that, oh, I could piece all of these things together. Let me tell you about, do with, with documentaries, right? right? There's two ways you can approach it. Sometimes you can just be filming over time and hope that a story will come out and it will be, the content that you have will, will, yeah. will give you a story to tell. And then the other way is you were just recording for prosperity and then you now look at it and say, ah, I can make a documentary out of this thing. My own case was the, the former. I, I was recording to make a documentary, another documentary for Wasu. But I just kept on recording and recording. So I didn't know when this recording would stop and I would collate it and everything. So I had recorded interviews, 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 and it just got to a point I thought, okay, what am I going to do with all this footage now? And because I was about to retire, like right now, officially, retire I'm from what now? For music. What? How? Why? Because I'm, you know, I'm done. I've done 20 years. I die. Music is a diversion for me. So I've done 20 years in this diversion. So I'm back on my main road now, which is filmmaking, oh. which is part of, I mean, I studied filmmaking and my, 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 my discipline was actually documentary filmmaking so back to your question what i did was i said okay i have this i have this i have this i have that i have that i have that what can i now do to firm it up so say for example the first time i met kathy kathy the dancer i met her at hip-hop world office actually they didn't have an office then they were using one hotel room somewhere in Abiola, mko Abiola garden and i met her and I and Shao introduced her and said, this is the girl that was in the baby scare scare video. Of course, we were in uh, London doing um, uh, intro. So I said, okay, we've played the video. You are the girl that was dancing and everything. So I said, Abbas, let's do an interview for this girl. Let's just help her, you know, blow it up and whatever. And then when we did the interview, in fact, the interview was very, very impromptu. We just went downstairs to the parking lot in the hotel and we did a full one hour interview. And I just realized that this girl has so much ambition. This girl has so much drive. This girl was looking forward. She already, you know, she was talking about everything Kathy is doing today. She was talking about it back then in 2005, 2006. You understand? She was saying, I'd like to build a company, a dance company. I'd like to, you know, with that same verb. So Kathy was the catalyst for me to do interviews with people I have interviewed back in the days. Like if you watch Kathy's interview, Kathy's segment in the documentary, I mixed that interview with, 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 with now, oh, wow. you understand? So especially when she was telling me about how she started, it's the same story how she started and then updated with what she's done since we interviewed her. So I was cutting it sort of like, uh, you know, I, I cut it together, the same story. But you can see that Kathy is saying it when she was, young and you know, and then now when she's loud she's, she's still not reserved but she's older now and everything so back to your question the moment i decided to start collating doing interviews and putting out the documentary was when i went to watch the video at o2 arena i looked around and i saw that we had twenty thousand people 
full house at the O2 Arena. Big venue. I mean, this is one of the biggest venues, you know. When we used to do shows, we used to get 2,000 capacity and we used to feel so happy. This is 10 times that 2,000 capacity. I'm like, okay, this is the right time. Not even knowing that Grammy was even going to come with Bonaboy. I'm like, this is the right time to do this documentary about the rise of Afrobeats. And it took me two years to complete it. And now putting it out, Burner Boy and Whiskey that won Grammy. So everything is timely. Just fell into place. Everything just fell into place. How do you, because we mentioned Cafe now, right? And you have all of those people standing out really young and you were with them. And some, now some of us are still young. Aha, my question is that. <laughs> How, do, do you feel in a way gratified to see all of these people have the success that they've enjoyed? Absolutely, absolutely. I will tell you people like Kathy. Kathy is one of the people that I'm very, very proud of. I am very, very proud of that girl because it's one thing to say things and speak it into existence. It's another thing to make it happen. And Kathy has made it happen even more. She just got a honorary PhD. You understand? So, Jimmy Jat, Ayo Anima Sham. These are the OGs in the industry. Kathy is one of the OGs. You understand? Ayo Anima Sham, Obi Asika. These are people that I met back like 99, 2000, and they're kind of like, and we didn't know that this thing that we're doing, that we were doing then, was going to become this big. So, in a way, for me, I wanted to represent those people. I wanted to show people like, okay, these people are still around though. Obi is still there. He's doing one uh, TV. Yeah, Obi is there. Jimmy is there. My partner, DJ Abbas in London, JJC. People don't understand the importance of JJC. JJC is a very important part of the Afrobeat story because back in 99, he had something that he was pushing called, you know, JJC is like a, was a big star in England yes. with big brothers. Big brothers yeah. yeah, they had like top 10 singles, right. they traveled the world. Soundtrack. Yeah, soundtrack for Scooby Doo, like every, yeah. So, but JJC wanted to be doing something that he called Afropean. I mean, the word Afropean did not take off, but he wanted to be putting Afro. In yeah. front of everything, Afri, Afro. You know, he did the song "We Are." Af yeah. So you know, it's he, JJC was very, very African. When JJC speaks English back then, he speaks the Fonair British. But when he speaks Yoruba, yeah. he sounds like his Yoruba is not even refined. In England, JJC is one of the people that were the foundations. It was the foundation of anything Afri or Afro, you understand? He was comfortable doing his pop music, making music, top of the pops, all this, you know, but he wanted to do something African. And for some reason, I mean, that's part of his story, they wouldn't let him do any African. So he, he, he left the group. He left the group that he pretty much started. Yes. You understand? Group, yeah. yeah, he left the group. Like, if you don't want me to do this, and for him to leave the group, I think what he wanted to do was, uh, I'll take my group. And they said, okay, well, we like the way the group is going. If you want to leave, you can leave. But they had to pay him off because contractual and everything. So he now used that money that he got to buy a building, build a studio, and gather new, a new group, 419 Squad, Shady Blue, uh, flu, uh, uh, what's this guy that I used to call the band Ski Band? Um, Stylo G, and all these people like Jamaican, African. He, he started a movement in England because he had the money. Like, he lived at the top of the building, and the middle floor was the studio, and then the ground floor is kind of like reception. And it's from that studio that people like Don Jazzy, the band came out. You understand, uh, uh, Master Plan that did Pata Pata, you know, he's, yeah, he's an original member of 419 Squad yes. and everything. So DJC was a leader of men and he was, he was, he had the foresight, although he was calling his own Afropean music, right. like Africans in Europe, you understand. But, you know, the name didn't catch on, but JJC is one of the, right. the foundation Let in the diaspora. JJC is in the in the document absolutely absolutely and um, and jjc jjc used to i mean the way i found jjc because we were just looking for videos and when we when we when we realized that jjc is in nigeria from big brothers there's another guy and big brothers called tayo 
who is the younger brother to Kiskirin. Kiskirin is a party planner, is a friend of ours. So we said, okay, this guy's a Nigerian. Let's play his big brother video. And he said, ah, but I have 419. I have this, I have that. I'm like, give us all the videos. That's when they did the video for RT Day. Big, you see, uh, uh, big brother today. Oh, oh, yeah. So when he did that today, we played that video and we invited him to intro. It was then that we started talking and JJC will now try to learn from me. Like he said he wants to be directing his own videos. He wanted to be, you know, like, you know, which is what he's doing now. He said he wanted to be directing his own videos. So, you know, we would now, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like JJC is just an important part as important as the program that we were doing called Intro because that was the first program for black music, not even African music, the first program for black music in the UK, even before MTV Base came to UK. So, yeah, so I'm taking the story from Nigerian uh, Foundation, UK Foundation, and then the ones I didn't know about, which is the Ghanaian part, I had to go to Ghana to go and find out. So, you know, you have this wide-reaching, um, important project that takes on all of the music of different places and different people. I'm going to ask you about a couple of people, right, which you've had interactions with and all whatnot. Just your thoughts and maybe just a story we didn't know about them before. Um, D1, that I didn't Ah, my guy. D1 is somebody that I admire a lot. A lot of people say we look alike. You know, fine boy at station of Nigeria. And, uh, <laughs> but I, even though I watch him and uh, uh, Babakeke, uh, Kenny, Kenny Ogunbe, I like D1 because of his swag. You understand? You know when, you know, it, it's like, when you like another man, or when you admire another man, like, I would like, you know, like, I would like to be like that guy. It's like when you're 10 years old or 11 years old, you say, I would like to be like Muhammad Ali. I would like to be like, you know, but that's, that's me. So when I got a chance to do TV in England, I said to Abbas, we are going to do a program just like Primetime Jams or AIT Jams. Like you would take on the Kenny Ogunbe persona. I would take on D1. And we will play it off like that. I mean, we beat off a lot of their concepts as well. We started going to the Grammys as well. We started doing the off the cuff because what, not that I, not that I, they don't rehearse their show or produce their show, yeah. but what they were doing looked like it was unrehearsed yes. and it was free. And that is how I want my program to be. We can talk about anything. We can laugh at, you know, so we don't have to be, yeah. what do you call it? We're we're too, too rigid. Right. Exactly. We want it to be loose. We want it to be free. We wanted to uh, uh, appeal to young people, you understand? Even though we were young-ish then, we were in our 30s. And really, yeah, D1 is somebody that I wanted to be like. And then when I met him, our, our spirits just connect. Our spirits connect. The day I met D1 at a function at Obalende Suya, we were sitting across the table from each other. Our eyes caught each other. I gave him the, that universal black man salute, like, you know, he gave it yeah. to me too. And then after when we're having dinner, I move, you know, I, I move, I, I, I move to his table and I, you know, talk to him like, you know, and he was like, and then he now recognized me. Don't forget that they were at AIT. Yes. And my film, even though we sold it, my film King of My Country, when I did it in 1996, was played on AIT till at the, I hear that the tape, the tape basically <laughs> spoils. I gave them that film after we had sold the video just to play for a couple of times and i think they were playing it once a week which which gave me a lot of exposure so he recognized me and then from in fact from then i was the one that you know with my car i went to drop him where he you know and then we went out later that night and we became friends you understand so d1 is my mentor my friend and my ego Ooh. okay i am a fella child when you say that, how do you... I mean, I, I mean, of course, biologically, I wasn't born by Fela, but I was uh, so influenced by Fela that I, I, sorry to say this, Dad, rest in peace. I listened to Fela more than my, my dad. No, honestly, like, like, I mean, my dad will be the, my dad was very strict and everything, but Fela was strict as well, but he was also a cool guy. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like I, I it's like I, it's like I, in a, in a perverse way, I wish he was my dad. 
And a lot of the kids that were around Kalakut at that time, whether were the children of some of his uh, uh, musicians or children of friends, or, you know, a lot of friends will come and their children, you know. So we, we, we see ourselves like the last children. And I knew of Ben Sinedonigi. Not that he was the manager there, but I knew of him as one of these journalists from, I think, well, Guardian or something. So we know the name Benson Idonije. It's, it's just one of those names that you know, like Yinka Craig or, or um, what's this guy? Frank Olize, thank you. Like people, Yori Folani, you know, like Sene or, or wherever. You know, you know them as, you know. So I knew, but you know the funny thing, I didn't know that he had managed Fela before. I, I, all I knew about him was he was a journalist and he was a very hard critic. I mean, I read a lot when I was younger. One of the things that my father instilled in me was to read, and Fela as well. Fela would give you books like the, the autobiography of Malcolm X at 12 years old, although I was younger. But he would give people like that to say, he, he, he would take the book. He'll be, he'll be, Fela would be arguing a point. He will now take the book and he will now tap the book like this and say, read this book. This is the answer. This is what you need to read for that one, that thing you're arguing yeah, with me. Yeah, to young younger people. I mean, I knew people like um, Dele Sosimi and all these people. You know, so he he would say, read this book. You understand all these things they're arguing with me. You will find the answer in this book. He will talk about Kwame Nkrumah. He will talk about uh, uh, Thomas Sankara. He will talk about all these people, even American. You know, like uh, what's this guy's name, James Baldwin. Like he would, he would give you a book and say, and say, read this book. So for me, I took a lot from Fela. So back to Benson, I didn't know that he had managed Fela. It was until later, even after I'd grown up in my teens. Then I realized that Benson Edonije had. And I met him one time again at the Guardian when I went to visit Steve Ayoide. And I think they were doing something. I don't know if uh, Uncle Benson was still working at Guardian then, but he was at the Guardian. They were doing something, Sha. So Steve Ayoide uh, uh, invited me. So I went and I met him and I talked to him briefly that act. Like, me too, I'm a fellow picking. And, you know, and he just said, okay, nice, nice, you know, and that was it. It was not until last year when I interviewed him for the documentary that we that we did a catch up. Because if you watch the Benson Edonije part of the documentary, apart from him talking about Fela, which was very, 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 very insightful, and I thank him for that. Although, and then we talked about Bonaboy as well. We talked about music in general. We talked about music in general, and it was still his very, very, his very, very hard self as a as a, as a critic. So when we now finished the interview, we now finished the interview, we now started to talk fella. And we now, we now realized that when I was like six, seven, eight years old, we were in the same place together. It was, it was a very, you know, I said we were mentioning, you know when you enter fella's house, you know, fella's uh, uh, gate man, the bodyguard, fella had like a pet monkey, you know, where he parked his cars. Like we were so vivid in our recollection. We were so vivid in our recollection of that fella time. Like where he parked his cars, his Range Rover, with the fella Africa 70 emblem on the side, you know. And you know fella used to do crazy things. He used to have, uh, he used to try to show you that it's vanity upon vanity. As in like the Benz that people were driving that day, that people were, fella had a, a, a Benz that he, 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 he turned it into a convertible. <laughs> Fela was, a, Fela was mad as shit. He, he, he actually cut the head of the, the, the Benz and the, that's the Benz, like I think it was the 280, whatever, the, the double bumper one. Yeah. He used to send people to go and buy fire. So it wasn't a myth? Because I heard, I heard this just when I was growing up, like, no, oh. Fela will call it. Fela used to do crazy shit. He, he, had a, he had a B2 that didn't have seats. I don't know whether they took the seats, whether they took the seats out intentionally or whatever. There was no seats. The person driving the the B two was sitting on block, you know, the uh, building blocks. Uh, it was such a crazy, you know. Fella used to do a lot of stuff just to show people that look, it's just money. All these Range Rover that we're driving now, they were thinking we we're feeling cool. Fella had like maybe four. 
Fela had money and he had that. Him and Sonny Okosun were like the kings of Suwule right. then. Sonny Okosun lived at the end of Inobi Street, Ikate. He had a dune right. buggy. You know what a dune buggy is? It's one of those quad, quad cars that they drive on the beach, right. just four wheel drives. When I met Sonny Okosun in 2005 and I did an interview with him, I went to his house in that Yaya Baton, whatever, in that church. And I was telling him this story. He looked at me and said, ah, ah, you, you really know me well. I said, we used to hail you <laughs> when you drive past in that dune buggy. That dune buggy was made for, for the beach, not for a road. He now said, they didn't, they do, well, he said all the superstars, they don't know how to do superstars. He said that dune buggy, when he, he, he did a show in Brazil, he bought that dune buggy. And then he said he, 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 he flew it, he flew it back on the same flight as his ex, excess luggage. So as he was landing from Brazil, the dune buggy was landing as well, and he rode it all the way from the airport. He said, "These people, these young boys, they don't know how to do superstar." Anyway, back to Benzin and Donijo. Yes, yes. <laughs> back to Benzin and Donijo. So we now sat down and we talked about everything, and even I still speak to him now. I, I have spoken to Benson and Donny Day more times than, than ever. Because I've only spoken to him like maybe once or twice before we did the interview. But now, and then after we did the interview, his wife, Bonner's mom's, uh, uh, Bonner's, uh, mom's mother, Bonner's grandmother, she now said, Hey, Nishi, interview you, Emino. Emino, no one stole the first off from you. Oh, wow. Ah, I said, okay, mommy. And I start, although I didn't, I were already packed up cameras. Yeah. I said, don't worry. When Bonner wins the Grammy, I will come wow. back and interview you. So I sat down with mommy and mommy now started telling me fella stories that I did not even know about. She was in charge of, this is an exclusive I'm giving you. Yes. She, was, <laughs> she was in charge of getting a place in Suwilere for fella's girlfriends. Mm. <laughs> she, oh, said, wow. she said that was, that was her job. So that Fela will now come and visit his girlfriends at the place. So she, that, that was her, her, her own job. And then she told me how she used to fight with uh, Uncle Benson, right. you know, when they will now go off and she will know that they've been, they've been naughty. You understand? <laughs> so she was, yeah. in the meanwhile, Uncle Benson was sitting down and saying, just be telling your own story. So. And we were speaking Yoruba. Oh, wow. Yeah, because, you know, we, yeah. you know it's, it's better like that. So yeah. I told her I'm going to come back and do that uh, interview. OJB and his wife that Korede. Okay. OJB. OJB Jezreel. God bless his soul. One of the founders of this sound. This sound. Because he was the first one, apart from him doing the whole hip hop gene, you know, the, the, the normal hip hop, he had the idea to fuse Fuji and hip hop, which resulted in the song Raise the Roof by Jasmine Olofi. When I interviewed him back then, I did, of course, I, I can't interview him now, but I, when I interviewed him back then, me and Abbas, yeah. he said a lot of things, and two things from what he said in that interview, which you will see in the, in, in the documentary. He talked about, he said, Fuji is our own rap or our own hip hop. He said, this Fuji is a culture. It's not just a music genre. He said that. He said that's why he wanted to fuse Fuji and hip hop, which resulted in the song. Jasmine Lofton was sitting next to him. The next thing he said was royalties. As far back as then, he talked about royalties. He said in other countries, producers get royalties, and which is true. But he said in this country, you don't get royalties. They treat you as part of the furniture. You understand? So once they collect your beats, and he is such a nice guy that he will make beats for everybody. He has made beats for everybody. And when I say everybody, I mean like everybody. You make beats for them, put it out. If the song hits, pay me. Of, obviously, some people didn't, did, not pay, did not pay him. And then also he did not get royalties. So it wasn't like he wasn't, he wasn't conscious of it. He was conscious of it, but he said there was a time that he, he spoke to a few people at P-Man that let's go to the next P-Man general meeting or whatever and table our grievances about uh, 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 um, um, publishing rights, royalties, and everything. And everybody was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said the day that he could. He said, when he, when he got there, he looked left, he looked right, there was nobody. They didn't want to rock the boats. 
So he just lost his, he lost his mojo there and everything. And it's so sad that this is a guy that produced a lot of artists, started their careers and produced some of the biggest songs. And he wasn't able to enjoy the fruits of his labor, his royalties before he died. Which brings us to Korede, who is his wife, one of his wives. Korede was the original Kukulet. When we came with them, the band to first of all do a showcase at uh, Tony Street White House with the band Don Jazzy. When we only just had two songs, Bobolo Omo and uh, Make I Tell Them to Coco Co uh, Tungolo, we got some dancers together, and she was one of the dancers. She danced so hard that day. I mean, that's not the reason why we named them Kokolet. The name Kokolet came up in when we went to go and do a Guinness show in uh, Potakot. We were talking about Bonnie M. You know, Bonnie M. with his yeah. three. Yeah, yeah the, the three wives. So there were three dancers. So the band was like, I'll be Bonnie M and everything. I'm like, okay, so I know that be, uh, you know, the dancers. And then because of the make I tell them the Coco, we just came up with that name, Cocolet. So there was Cocolet 1, which was, uh, I think, the Pisola or Busola, Cocolet 2, which was uh, Larry. And I've forgotten the, she's a girl with, no, Tunde. This girl called Tunde. She, I remember her because she has a male name. Yeah, and then the other girl, I forgot the other name, I think it was Funke or something. So those were the three. But the original Coco Let, which is the first dancer, was Korede, because they used to call her Coco. That's what they call her. They still call her that today. That's the name of her food business as well. Plug, plug. So Korede is the one now that is pushing for OJB's royalties and to keep his spirit and his name and legacy alive. But she is in the documentary as well. And she was also one of the first professional dancers, Her even before Kafi. But Kafi just kind of like blew out because of Baby Skeske. Korede did uh, uh, Maintain uh, in Maintain. India. Uh, right. Yeah, That's... she did. Uh, yeah, she did the Osho, Osho Bamba, Osho Free. She, she did a lot of, uh, in fact, and there's some videos that they actually did together. But it's just that Kafi just kind of like blew up like that because yeah. of her drive and her birth. Yes, right. yes. Okay. We trace so many stories from Benson and Donny J to Kenny and D1. For somebody who didn't live in that era, and there's a lot of them now, right? What's the what's the one thing you want them to take away from watching Afrobeats documentary? The backstory. Is I don't want them to, I don't want them to take one thing away. I want them to take many things away. I want them to take history. I want them to take facts because I present the story with video evidence. You understand? And from the mouths of people that were there, it's not just me telling the story. I'm telling my own part of the story and I'm creating a link. But most of the stories were told by the people that were there. So I want them to take away history, learn the history, learn facts. Yeah, you will learn the facts unless you can disprove it, which I found very hard. I mean, this documentary is open to uh, criticism, it's open to review, it's open to fact check, it's open to anything. You understand? But I, I, I've done enough research and apart from doing research, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> you understand? I saw it happen. So I want them to take history, education, enjoyment, and good vibes. <laughs>